Right on. Like I say, my name's Hunter. Uh, like they both said, guys, any questions that you guys have, please feel free to stop me. Uh, let me know if I'm unclear on anything, um, anything I can help out with. So uh, this is a Bandit 75 XP track style chipper. Uh, this is a seven inch rated style chipper, uh, disc style compared to a drum style like that 990 you guys have down in the yard. Um, 49 horsepower Kubota diesel engine. Really guys, this is a, a real easy uh, machine. Once you learn the remote control and the safety of this unit, there's really not too much to this specific machine. Um, now you, most of you raise your hands on if you've ran a chipper before, so that's great. Again, this is just gonna be a refresher on that, uh, going over operation, safety, some maintenance things as we work around. If you guys kinda wanna wrap around here, um, I know we're a little tight. I'm gonna start up here on the control box and the remote, and then we'll just work our way around this unit as we go. So, um, as Pat said, guys, we got this wireless remote control. So this is gonna run all of the functions on this machine. Again, it's real self-explanatory. Now, if this goes down, we do have a tether backup. Uh, this cord would unplug here like so. Uh, that would come off. And then in that bag over there on that fender is a uh, radio, excuse me, a tether remote that would plug in there. You'd run the controls from there. Just to give you guys an idea, this remote is $6,000 and they're about six months back ordered right now. So please be extremely cautious anytime you're handling this remote. Uh, please do not set it on any tracks on the machine. Keep this machine, this remote with you at all times so no damage is done to it. Um, it is rechargeable. So we got a charging port up here, which is in that bag as well. Um, if those batteries go bad for any reason, these two plugs on here, unscrew, AA batteries will go in there. Um, the batteries that are in there right now are chargeable. If you replace them to just regular Duramax AA's, obviously those aren't rechargeable. So just something to keep in mind. Um, red stop button up here, this is gonna override everything on the machine. That button gets hit, this machine's gonna kill itself no matter what's going on. It's an emergency stop switch if there's an emergency uh, that's going on at that time. Um, that's, there we go. So once you see green on that guys, you know you're good to go. Um, now, if you were to start this machine up, you link it up to your radio, the machine shuts itself off. First thing we want you to do is check that. If it links up and that's pushed down, it's gonna kill the machine, not gonna run at all. Now, on this startup procedure here, it's gonna break down the startup procedure for this machine. So you guys see off, on, and start. We're gonna turn this key to the on position. We're gonna see bandit chippers appear on the screen. Our preheat on real cold mornings, it may make you wait a second just like your trucks would. Um, and then we get all of our gauges popped up from there. So just a quick reading on that. You got RPM reading, battery voltage, PSI, temperature, hour reading right in the middle, feed speed. Um, the main important one on this guys is gonna be right underneath that hour reading. Uh, right now we say manual. So manual is telling the machine you're moving it manually from the valve stack, which we never want you to do. Um, again, so you have three ways to move this, manual, radio, tether. Um, radio and tether being the only two we want you to run. So to get to that radio remote, and I'll show you again when we're started up here. Um, so we have five buttons on this main screen. The middle button says mode. When we click that button, we come to a new screen. So now you see that arrow's on manual. If you cre uh, click, excuse me, that same button again, drops down to radio. If I were to start this up right now, it'd link up to our radio. We'd be live through the remote. If we were going tether, you guessed it, you drop down to tether, tether runs that remote, you're good to go. Um, now you see right now that's blinking and that symbol is on. All that's telling us is that that tether is not plugged in. So if you guys ever see that signal, uh, whether you drop down to radio and you get that signal, that flashing with that uh, small circle X, that's telling you something's going on up here in the receiver that's linking up to this remote. So if you see that when you're in radio and everything is linked up as properly, there's probably something else going on uh, that needs to be looked at. We'll go ahead and plug this here back in. Where are we at? So uh, coming back guys, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna go back to this back arrow, back to the main screen. Um, so the other four buttons that are running on this, 
is menu purge mode and maintenance really the only one you guys need to mess with is the mode the maintenance the menu that would adjust things on your screen such as language brightness anything like that um, that would actually change those readings in there so i'm going to go ahead i'm going to turn that back off now the one thing i want to hit on this guys when we turn that key off it's going to break down on this sticker here we need to allow 15 seconds for a complete engine shutdown before you restart that key cycle back on that's a very important point right there so give it 15 seconds um do whatever you got to do before you restart that key cycle up and then continue on yes sir and the reason for that is is that when you do turn it off that clutch assembly that drum assembly in there is heavy and it continues to rotate and if you don't know that and you go ahead and turn it again you're going to turn it on and it's already rotating and you can strip some stuff out yep um on this remote guys this white button here in the middle that's going to turn our remote on so you hold that for a second we see these gauges here um you need to make sure to turn this remote off when you're done running this remote does not turn itself off if you leave it on and you set the remote down and come back tomorrow this remote's going to be toast and then you're running it through the tether and it's really not ideal to run it through the tether yeah so i have a question yeah by any chance like or like out of nowhere if that remote like malfunctions is there like another emergency like device or like stop button on, on, on the chipper um there wouldn't be an emergency shut off like that well actually yes your tether let me back up here if that happens if this remote unlinks while you're running the machine's going to shut itself down it's going to idle itself down it's going to sit at idle to where you cannot chip um it'll still be running and then at that point you'd want to shut the machine all the way down unplug this hook up your tether and then continue on your operation so yeah you as far as an emergency shutdown on the physical machine there's not besides the key cycle and your control bar on the back um, not like what the remote has um, on this remote guys you're going to see down here in this bottom corner it says for track mode press either enable button so up here on the top of the remote we have two enable buttons you need to hold either one of those down to run your track functions so your big toggles here are going to run your tracks independently controlled um, so if you want to track this machine, you need to hold either one down and then you can run those tracks uh, while you're doing that. Now the easiest way, you've got forward and reverse the way if I you hold either button down, you can operate both of the uh, both of the joysticks. Correct. Yep. Okay. Um, so right now if I if I turn the machine on, linked everything up and I just try to move it like this, nothing's going to happen. Okay. But as soon as I hold either one down, the machine's going to start moving with me. And just be aware too, you'll hear it once we start it up, your beeper here, every time you move the machine, this is gonna be beeping. Out of habit, you start the machine up, you're standing right here, obviously not in the tracks way. You move the machine, this thing's right in your ear, so just friendly note, just be cautious of where that is. Um, from there guys, you're gonna have a few different other controls on this remote. Um, the main two that is gonna run on this machine, we're gonna have a lot of dead switches on here, but the main two we're gonna have is throttle up and then feed forward and reverse. So when we start this machine up, we engage the clutch, we throttle up to running RPMs, that feed wheel is not gonna automatically start spinning on its own. You would have to hit feed forward on this remote and then that feed wheel will start running. Um, so we'll leave that there. Any questions on this remote? Yeah. Is there a switch to turn the um, chute? Not on this one. So this one's going to be a manual um, just because of the size of the machine. So you'll just want to undo this pin here and then really a rope may be ideal on there and then that'll allow you to spin the chute around. And then obviously manual flipper down there on the end. Um, any more questions on the remote? Yeah. So that forward reverse button works the same way as the lever usually does. Exactly. Right? So this okay. lever is going to override that toggle. So if you're the operator running the remote, but if you have someone feeding the machine and there's an emergency that you need to hit that bar into reverse, you hit this bar into reverse, it doesn't matter what the remote's in. This is gonna override that remote. So this will be, um, to get back to your question earlier, this is essentially the emergency on the machine. This okay, would cool. hit it into reverse when uh, you're feeding. But, yep, um, and I'll, I'll touch on that more as we work our way around. Um, but good question. So actually, that's a good question. If you leave that in reverse and you go and hit that toggle into forward, it's going to spin in reverse. And then you'd want to hit this back into forward. That'll spin that feed wheel forward and you'll be good to go. Okay. Um, coming up here, again, self-explanatory, guys. Fire extinguisher there. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to take these keys with me as we start walking around. Um, 
if you guys kind of want to come back around here uh sorry to make you keep moving i want to hit on this clutch real quick and uh spend a second here so you guys are all familiar with the clutch system and how that's working on the older style chippers like that 990 down there or other models it's an NACD over center style clutch. So what that means is your handle is down and you're bringing it up and you're pushing it into gear. And then depending on the style of clutch, you would lock your body weight in, those plates would lock into gear, your clutch is engaged. This is gonna be a different system. So please make sure you're familiar with this before you start running it. This is what we refer to as an NACD spring loaded clutch. And we are up is disengaged and we're dropping down into gear. Now, when I say spring loaded, when you put that handle down, it's gonna wanna go on its own. Now, we're gonna wanna use the same engagement process as the older style clutch, what we refer to as the bump style method where you're slowly bumping that clutch into gear. So what you wanna do on this one is you wanna hold your weight back against this handle. Right about here, you're gonna hear those engine RPMs start to drop as those plates start touching. You wanna bump it off about three to five times to allow some inertia on that disc. Once that engine RPM stops dropping, you put that handle down, you throttle up, you start chipping. Can you break it down just a little bit more um, what that is? I mean, in other words, the drive system. So everybody has a better idea of what's happening in here. Yep. So if we had a, a clear plexiglass looking into this machine here, guys, uh, what's going on when we start this machine up, there's a flywheel that's coming off the back of the engine that's spinning, let's say at 800 RPMs, whatever that idle may be. So that flywheel is spinning at 800 RPMs. Well, the clutch is disengaged. So your clutch pack is sitting right about here compared to that flywheel spinning at your RPM. When you're engaging that system, when you're pushing this handle down, it's pressing these plates together and now your clutch is picking up to that RPM of the engine. So as those plates start to bump together, now you're slowly, you're bumping it off. Um, as they start to slowly bump together, get some speed behind them, when you let that handle go, they're running together, that disc, this belt, everything is running in motion. Now, that is why we need to practice that bump style method because again, if you were looking in here in a clear plexiglass and you take that clutch handle and you just jam that thing down, you're asking your clutch, your belt and your disc to pick up to your RPM right now without letting any inertia get behind it. So when you bump it in, you're slowly allowing everything to come together to work as one essentially and pick up that inertia with you're that. You're trying to match the speed of the machine to the speed of the engine. Exactly. That's what that lever does. So you've got to ease into it. You can't just hammer down because it'll, yep. it'll be a disaster. And that actually. is why guys, we have a sticker here on this belt cover. It is extremely important that you engage this clutch and disengage at an idle only. Um, same thing as I was just talking about. If you start this machine up, you rev this engine up to full throttle, again, let's say 2,500 RPMs, and then you engage this clutch, well, you just ask that clutch, disc, and belt to get to 2,500 RPMs right now. And it may do it a handful of times before it smokes that clutch, and then you're putting a new clutch on this machine. Now, the importance of that, this machine will only move with that clutch engaged. So in order to do any functions on this machine, you have to have this clutch engaged. So if you guys smoke this clutch or something happens to this clutch and you're trying to load this machine up, you're dead in the water. Now we have to have a mobile mechanic come out, put a new clutch on, which is never an easy job. So we can't stress enough how important this clutch is that it does not get damaged. Um, that whole system if you're curious you ever want to see it it's just a pump running off the back of this belt um so it's on the back side of this clutch housing that pump is running all of our hydraulics it's a live hydraulic feed system um so in order for that hydraulic system to run that clutch has to be engaged sending that fluid moving but but on a positive note it's pretty easy to engage yeah. if you just take it easy and just start moving it into it. I, remember, you're just trying to match it. So you, when you're pulling that lever down, the rest of the machine is starting to gear up and then you catch it again, you catch it again and it's starting to speed up, speed up, speed up. So by the time you're ready, the lever just drops in and you can listen and hear it and know. So once you're used to it, it's it becomes muscle memory and it's just think about it ahead of time. 
Exactly, and another important thing is too, guys, um, if you're ever engaging this clutch, you hear something slapping, you hear something squealing, you smell rubber being burnt, um, you just hear something that's not right, stop immediately and let's find out what's going on. <coughs> Excuse me, disengage your clutch, shut the machine down, and then let's find out what's going on. Um, a lot of times, especially on these track style chippers, as the machine is moving, if you have any debris that is left right here in this gap uh, from your last branch that went through, while the track is moving, that wood chip may vibrate and it may fall underneath that disc. And then that next time you come to start this machine up and engage that clutch, that disc catches that chip on the bottom of that belly housing and it locks that disc up. We've seen it happen with chips, no kidding, that big. I uh, smoked a clutch on a, a demo for one of our guys. So, so and that, I'm not trying to belabor that, but the you know, it's hard to visualize that. But the reason why that is, and I've seen it too, is that that little stick is right in the right lever or right in the right angle. So now the minute you start to pull on that lever, it just barely starts to move. And that thing rolls over, hits that branch like that, and it's not going. And then you keep trying to power it and it just keeps burning it up that's that's what happens you're starting to you, you there's debris in there and it's and it doesn't have to be very big now the beauty of this clutch guys it is a non-adjustable spring-loaded clutch so you guys do not have to do any maintenance on the inside of that pack housing um the only maintenance that does have to be done on this clutch and i really want to stress this it's on the bottom point of that lubrication chart it's one shot of grease every 100 hours of operation. You can over grease it. It is sealed bearings in there. If you hit that clutch pack more than one shot every 100 hours, you're gonna over grease that clutch. Same thing, you're gonna be buying a new clutch for the machine. So just make sure, um, not a bad idea too. This is your guys' machine, do what you want with it. Uh, right with a Sharpie right here, grease zerks, one shot every 100 hours. That way, again, like Mike said, if you guys have turnover, uh, a new guy comes on the crew, accidentally hits that over greases that clutch and now you got problems so um, just make sure it's that one shot every hundred hours and you'll be good to go there any questions on the clutch we'll run it here in a little bit so yeah, you guys we'll have fire a it up at the end and uh, go over everything um, this drive belt here just so you guys again can can know what's going on with this machine um, again clear plexiglass looking in when these plates compress there's a pulley running off the back of this clutch pack that's running to a pulley back here this is just the belt that's transferring all that power now you, again you guys don't really have to worry about that but bandit is going to tell you after the first two hours of running to retighten that belt now this is more for you guys um, you don't necessarily have to follow that sticker. Just know it does need to be adjusted at some point. And I'll go over that with you when we're done here. Um, so that's your dry belt. Now, before I get ahead of myself, guys, obviously we're sitting on rubber track undercarriage system. Um, we were talking before about how much fun it is putting a track back on in the forest. And I say that very sarcastically. That is a, a hell of a job that no one wants to do. So as the operators you guys need to make sure that these tracks are properly tensioned now if you follow cats manuals they tell you to pick the machine up off the ground and measure the slack in the track i'm not going to tell you to do that simply guys just get a feel for this track if you're grabbing on this and this thing is flexing like so uh, you need to get some grease in there right away now it's these two little allen uh, screws here this plate comes off there's a grease zerk in there you simply just grease it until it can't take more grease um, best way for that, I know 21st technology, uh, everyone loves battery powered grease guns. Use a hand pump on that track. A battery, you'll blow the, the uh, seal off the back of that and create a nightmare for yourself. A hand pump, pump it until you physically can't pump any more grease in there. You're good to go on the tracks. Same thing, when you grease this side, your other side needs to be greased as well. It's two individual things. Um, you want? Real quick, just to explain to you what would happen if this track kicks off. Um, you would take that off, that grease zerk that we're pumping grease into, you would take that grease zerk off, and then you would essentially have a sledgehammer works the best. You'd hit this wheel and pop all your grease out until this lever is fully compressed down. Then you're taking breaker bars and you're throwing this track back onto the rails. You're tightening everything back up and greasing it up. I've done this. And my 15 second explanation is not 15 seconds to do. That's a, a full day project. So 
Um, the best practice guys, never turn this machine on stumps, rocks, or any debris. Only turn it on flat surfaces. Um, we were talking earlier, if you see a track start to come off, stop. Don't, don't try and finagle that thing back on. Just stop, uh, assess the situation, and then continue on from there. So just be aware of where you're turning this machine uh, when you're driving it deep in the woods. Any questions on the tracks? Perfect. Um, talked about the discharge shoe, guys. You do have two 916 bolts up here. Uh, you can drop those bolts. If this ever clogs up on you, uh, drop those bolts down. You can unclog that discharge shoe from there. Um, if this machine clogs up on you, there's something seriously out of adjustment. Uh, chances are it's going to be dull knives. Is majority of the time that's what the problem is, which I'll go over that when we jump on the back side of the machine. Uh, just real quick to talk about battery box here. Just so you guys know what this is, uh, high pressure hydraulic filter. Again, just so you know what that is. This is going to bring us to our first uh, daily greasing point. So anywhere that needs daily greasing we're going to have a little sticker pointing back to it so that tiny little bearing there and then there's going to be one on this feed wheel as well that needs grease um, oh, I see it. so when we say daily we're referring to an eight hour work day um, 10 shots or as needed on those greasing points um let's see how do we know that belt is tight this belt mm -hmm. oh thank you I was wondering. So guys, um, Mike asked if you didn't hear, how do we know that belt is tight? And he's talking about this drive belt that we were talking about that needs to be retightened. Um, we're gonna have this tool here. It's a two-sided tool. It's a belt tension check and an anvil check on this side. So this belt tension check tool simply just goes in that little hole right there. That's great, I think that, yeah, that's not big enough. Um, so you're simply just gonna get a feel for that belt. Actually, let me see if I can do that. So you put it in there, simply just get a feel for that belt tension on there. So before you take that out, um, I recommend you just feel that real quick. Um, let me see if we got a skinnier one because that should go in there without having to take that rubber piece off. Um, so that's how you would check your, your belt tension underneath that uh, cover there. How often should you do that, Hunter? So um, Bandit, again, is going to tell you after the first two hours of running, um, realistically, depending on what you're sending through this machine, you're going to need to do that about three to four times and adjust those belts before those are fully broken in and two proper adjustments. So um, for, I would say, about the first 50 hours, let's say check that every day, just get a quick tension on that. Um, if it needs to be adjusted, go ahead, retighten them, and then continue on with the operation. Um, we're going to go ahead guys, just so you guys know, um, actually I'll talk about these, but just so you know, under this cover, this is our hydraulic, uh, stack here. This is where all the hydraulics are running through. Um, keep an eye out on that. If there's any leaks or anything on that, that may need to be addressed. Um, we have our level gauges here guys. So bandit's going to give you a breakdown of the terrain. You can keep this machine on, but essentially follow these levels. These are going to be your, your best way to go. You do have oil sensor settings in this engine. So if you get this machine on too steep of grade, it's going to shut itself down. But before that happens, just take a quick peek on um, this one, obviously side to side, this one up and down. Obviously if this bubble starts to get into the orange, you shouldn't be taking the machine there. Um, if you guys ever see a hill and you say, Hey, will this machine make that? Let's just go on the safe side and say, no, um, <laughs> let's find another way down. We've seen too many machines roll down hills. It's great for us, bad for you guys. Um, <laughs> just be cautious guys when you're going down those steep terrains. Um, we'll go ahead. We'll drop that in feed tray and go on the back of this machine real quick to talk about this. Sir. So again, guys, seven inch wood chipper, um, it's nothing crazy, but we do still want to talk about it. Like Pat was saying, um, never stick your arms past this point of the infeed tray here. Never stand on the infeed tray and kick material in. Um, it sounds like a joke when I say that, but we've had guys killed from doing exactly that. They're kicking material in, catches their foot, pulls them through the machine. Um, same thing when you're reaching past here, obviously you increase your chances of being pulled in. 
we ideally want to avoid firewood size pieces. Um, that's where we see a lot of injuries and accidents come in because when you have that firewood size piece and you toss it in and it hits that feed wheel and it bounces back right there, your first natural inclination is to reach in here and push that material towards that feed wheel. Um, do not do that. Um, keep it in two to three foot long pieces. That way there is something uh, to grab onto for that feed system. So this machine, before I get ahead of myself, is equipped with uh, reversing auto feed. So that is set up. You guys are probably familiar with it on the other machines. When you send a seven inch log through this machine and it drops that engine RPM down to a certain RPM, it's gonna stop that feed wheel, allow that engine to pick itself back up and then continue to feed that material in. So if you guys are ever feeding, again, bigger logs through and you say, hey, this thing is pausing, that's supposed to happen. Now, on firewood size pieces, you kind of eliminate that tool on your own because a firewood size piece, once it gets past that feed wheel, there's nothing for that feed wheel to grab, to stop, to allow that engine to pick itself back up. Compared to longer pieces, uh, if that engine drops down to that RPM, that feed wheel can stop, it'll pick itself back up and then continue to feed that log in. So again, avoid those log size pieces. Um, as we talked about earlier, guys, this bar is gonna run everything on the machine, pull out to feed, push into reverse. There is a neutral right in the middle right there. Um, you guys see these last chance cables. If you find yourself being pulled in, pull that cable, it's gonna kick that bar into reverse. We call those the no hope ropes. If you have to rely on those, you have no hope, you're already through the machine. Now, again, this is a seven inch diameter, so I mean, for me, that's tough to squeeze me into there, uh, thankfully. But the bigger style chippers that CCC also runs, the 250s, the larger style, we see a lot of deaths and accidents with those. So uh, you need to be cautious when working around the infeed tray. Like Mike was talking about earlier, guys, when you have your material, best practice is feed your material through, loop around, go get your next bite of brush. You do not need to stand here and watch the machine perform. Um, multiple reasons if Mike has another brush where he's standing and I'm standing here watching it well now Mike can't get in to feed his material also as Mike was talking about if any materials whipped either way it catches you in the face we've all been there it's not fun it hurts it stings um, just not what you want when you're running these machines so please be extremely cautious when you're feeding this machine uh, we are gonna supply you with this tool here guys this is just a wooden pusher paddle. It's in there. There we go. <laughs> yeah, secure. Um, use this tool, guys, to push that smaller material to that feed wheel. Thank you. Um, as you guys see there, that corner is going to catch. When this tool is grabbed by that feed wheel, let it go. Do not fight the machine. This tool is completely made of wood. It is designed to be chipped. If you hold on to it and this kicks, it's either going to pull your hand down and crush your knuckles or pull your hand up and crush your knuckles. Let it go. Um, if you're happy to waste money, we're happy to sell you another one. Um, the biggest thing we ask guys, please do not replace this with any shovels, rakes, metal, plastic, anything other than this tool uh, that was designed to go in here. Obviously in this industry guys, branches work wonders. If you find a nice stick with a V on it, use that to push that material in because this will get chipped through probably pretty quick um i'll finagle that back in there later any questions on how to feed the chipper guys perfect um just to hit it again on that remote when you drive this machine up to your pile you need to hit feed forward and then that feed system will start spinning uh, to feed that material in if you guys want to wrap around this back side Hit a couple more points and then we're just about done. Any questions overall? Anything I may have skipped over or unclear on, guys? Yeah. You got a question? Diesel? Yes. Yep. So your diesel is going to be here in this tank, hydraulic oil here. Um, now we have lockable caps on them. Not a bad idea to get a, a lock on that hydraulic oil just so you don't put a diesel into oil. Um, so, yeah, it's a good question. Diesel on this. Guys, if any questions come up while you're out in the field, that uh, black um, box there is going to have the owner's manual. Thank you. Uh, an operations manual for this machine. Now, that's going to be specific to just Bandit 75 XP, not necessarily on tracks. 
So any track related questions will be in another set of manuals. Uh, but as far as your knives, your greasing points, uh, any parts related to the machine will be in that manual there. Um, that's gonna bring us to two more daily greasing points. We're gonna have a grease circ there, grease circ there. Now back here guys, you see this tongue jack here. Um, on this chipper, because of the, the size of it, there's not a lift cylinder. So if you have to open that feed system up to either check your anvil setting or unclog it, what you wanna do is mount that jack right there and then you're gonna crank it all the way down. Um, you guys get the picture. You crank it down, you crank this, and this wheel is gonna open up to allow you to get in there and clean out your feeding system. Now, when we're doing that guys, obviously anytime you're in there, keys in pockets, uh, unplug the hood pin safety device, which I'll touch on here in a second. This, uh, either pin, it doesn't matter, will lock out your feed system to where it won't fall back down on you. So make sure that pin is inserted through and then do whatever maintenance you have to do. The other one would be for your disc lock pin uh, to change your knives on there. So up top there guys, I just touched on it real quick on your hood pin safety device. So if that plug is unplugged, uh, this is a, the plug I'm talking about. When that is unplugged, nothing on this machine is gonna work. So if you ever come out to the machine, you start it up in the morning and nothing turns on on your screen, first thing we want you to check is your hood pin safety device to make sure that's plugged in. What that plug is doing, uh, when that is unplugged, it's telling the computer system that this disc housing is open and you have direct access to those knives. So anytime you're doing maintenance in there, you unplug it, then start working in the infeed tray. Um, obviously to change your knives, you would have to unplug that, but that is what your hood pin safety device is. Now, do you want to open this up or? I, sure. What are you doing? Uh, yes. They're not going to mess with it. No, they won't mess yeah. with it. They ain't going to mess with it. Okay. I'll, I'll mess with we it. We will. All right. They won't. I'll okay, we can We talk. both have. Cool. Okay. Um, so that guys, that's essentially your door for your disc housing. Um, that would give you direct access to that disc, your chipper knives. Um, your knife is obviously what is actually cutting the wood. Um, so that's what that door would be. Um, after that guys, that about wraps us up. Um, before I get ahead of myself, you do have another grease daily point here, run into that bearing there. Um, and then your, we touch on that one over there. Um, well, actually, Pat, we may want to. So there is a daily bearing that's going to be underneath this door. All right, so we got that. Okay, perfect. So, a um, little gold key up top, guys, is opened up by the little gold key on the, the key lock. That comes up. Again, hood pin safety device unplugs. You push this handle down, pull that bar. That's going to allow you to open that up. Now, when you do that, guys, you're going to see uh, there's a, a grease point on that bearing. So that's going to need to be hit every day. Um, again, eight hours, 10 shots. Got it. 10 shots? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Wait. Stuff yeah. Yeah, exactly. Good red thing. Good oh, wow. Oh, okay. okay. Huh. And then that's also, if your, your knives were dull, need to be replaced, that's where you would be doing that, that maintenance on. Perfect. Go ahead. Um, guys, just to about wrap this up, um, hydraulic oil filters in line on this tank. So on this sight glass here right now, we're obviously in green. If you see that get into the yellow, just let the guys know that that needs to be addressed. Once you get into the red, you want to address or replace that as soon as possible. Um, red lever on the hydraulic fluid. What is that? That is a shut off for our hydraulic system, guys. So you want to leave that handle where it is now. Um, don't ever mess with that. That would be if we had to uh, plug in to test hydraulic pressures. That's where we would shut the hydraulics off, thank you, and test your hydraulic pressure. So um, the reason we don't want to mess with that is because if you hit that handle into a uh, lock and you lock out that hydraulic system and you leave it there for an extended period of time, you're going to pop a hydraulic line and create a hydraulic geyser of oil so just leave that handle um, if it's too tempting for you and you just can't resist it you can uh, undo that little bolt there and take that handle off so you don't mess with it but 
fight the shining urges. I know. It's, yeah. Yeah. it's tough. <laughs> Want to open up these side covers? <laughs> Take a look yeah, and see. Yeah. Yeah, um, and then uh, what about running it? Yeah, guys. Um, that covers the, the walk around. We could go ahead and fire it up real quick and uh, get a chance at moving it around so everyone's familiar with that. Any questions before we do that? This thing has an automatic shut off if the hydraulic oil is too low. It does not. Nope. Does not. It does not. So your your sight glass um, here is going to give you that reading there. Okay. Um, on level ground, you want to be a quarter to three quarter. If you have to top that off, um, you're going to have uh, this sticker here. This is Petro Canada Hydrex XB, um, AW46 regular tractor hydraulic oil. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, okay. mixes with that tank. So yeah, I, I was just wondering because I know some pieces of equipment they have that automatic we'll shut, it shut down. off. Yeah, yeah. For the hydraulic. Uh, that'd be nice. Um, only other thing, um, whose responsibility for air filters? Would that be the crew? Uh, to clean it daily? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so guys, I skipped over this. On the top of this housing here, we have our air, air filter housing. Um, Kubota recommends weekly to bi-weekly. You take this cap off and clean that air filter out. Uh, they no longer want you blowing those air filters out. They want you to tap them out or replace them. Uh, just so you're not opening up the filter system on that actual filter itself. I always say guys, a $30 filter is cheaper to replace than a $30,000 engine. If you guys see that air filter is dirty, if you see the inside air filter is dirty, both of them need to re be replaced right away. So when you're checking that, make sure you're checking that, uh, these clips here that just boom, 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 this cap comes off, you check your, your air filters in there. That's whatever your practices are. Yeah, we're, um, I'll tell you weekly to bi weekly, but if you want to go daily, then it just depends on what we're chipping. Yep. A lot of it, too. If you're chipping a lot of dead, dusty, dirty shit, check that thing daily. Yep. And a lot of the stuff we're going to be chipping is going to be dead, dusty, dirty shit. So it doesn't hurt to check it daily. Perfect. Um, this here, guys, just so you know what this is, we have a little cover over it. Obviously, you want to be careful of that. Uh, that's a hydraulic oil cooler. That will only come on when it needs to. So if that hydraulic oil gets to a certain temperature, you'll hear that fan kick on. Um, so if you're ever running it and that's not on, that's okay. It's not designed to be on 24 seven. Perfect. Um, what the hell do you use the pedal hatch for? <laughs> recovery. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I don't want to. I don't want to know how to do that one. Yeah, he goes. Make sure you ain't sure shiny told yeah, me that's, that. That's not a thing <laughs> over there. It's like down the side of a hill, jammed between two giant boulders. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Perfect. Well, I'll turn these over to you guys. Um, if you guys <coughs> want to fire it up.
Oh, Let's go, come on, Hunter. Let's help him. Did you pay attention? Right. I did. Let's help him. Let's get this on film. You okay, first off, what, 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 did we, when we talked about shutting it off and turning it back on, remember what we talked about. What do we say about when you shut it off, what do you got to do before you turn it back on? Um, this the clutch. You gotta wait. Wait, how long? Okay. It usually says in here 15 to 20 seconds to allow a complete shutdown. You're beyond that now, okay? Mm -hmm. But why do we do that? Um, so we can let this slow down, let the whole machine stop spinning. Stop spinning. And, and the electronics have to restart. So right, they reset something. themselves. So everything has to go back. You just can't turn it on, turn it off, turn it on. You just gotta wait. Okay. You can never be in a hurry on this. Okay. In life, really. So, you ready? Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's do it. To the on. Yeah, uh, Three heat, and then cycle off. And typically, you leave that on if you're heating up the glow plug. Right now, it's just already been pre-warmed up, so you really don't need to worry. But let that come up on. Where's the glow? Where's the glow plug? Simple again. It's not. So I wait. So about when you turn it on, you see bandit checkers. Um, if it needs to heat up, it'll say right below bandit checkers. It'll say preheat. Wait to start. Oh, and then okay. once that disappears, then it'll take you to your RP your gauges, and then you're gonna. Yeah. So you're good to go. Good to go, sir. <laughs> spring because yeah. when you push that down it wants to go in so it, i don't know if you saw me or not but i put my hand here because you will want to just kind of pull it right down quick so just be careful
Okay, um, just want to do a quick wrap up and, and say thank you guys for uh, being as patient. Each training is always different and each machine is always different. So, and the audience is also different. I mean, I hope that we gave you something that you can use here today. And if not, um, there's a number on the side of the machine and it's right there. Equipment. Yep, and you can call that number and if uh, you can ask for Hunter or Mike and actually they'll have to give you my phone number but um, I'll be happy to help anybody if you have questions or you need something or you're stuck or something like that anything like that we'll be happy to um, this isn't just like hey here you go see you later it's 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 complicated I mean it's complicated dangerous equipment always is right and and actually I was pretty impressed with some of you guys are pretty handy I'm definitely not but um, as far as joystick controls and all that that just kind of comes with the generation right so um, does anybody have any questions that you go man I wish I would have said something because we'll I mean we'll be happy to stay as long as you like and it, if you have go ahead just a quick question like if the, one of the, the hoses that say like PSI they just like um, were to come off they, we would go directly to you guys like we would have the yeah, you should, and and then we can, might be able to help you. Actually, it, it, first thing you should know is definitely there's a machine serial number on each one of these. Before you call, get that number because it's the first thing you'll be asked. What's the number? And then they'll say, what is the thing? There's also um, a sheet with part numbers on here. There's a list, and and um, that's that has everything that you need. But to decipher that, give give me or Hunter a call. We'll help you do that. Totally help. And uh, on those hydraulics, actually, thank you for saying that. Um, all the fittings on there, guys, they're all JIC fittings. So um, besides that branch we just sent through, that was the first load that this machine has had on it. Um, it's not uncommon that we see those hoses loosen up over time. So if you ever see a small little hydraulic leak, um, just throw a wrench on it, tighten it up. But yeah, if one pops, you can give us a call. We'll help you out. I actually had a question. Is there any kind of warning system or if there's something that's going wrong, like will there will a little alert pop up on the screen? Yes. Yeah, so you'll have a code pop up, um, and it'll give you a number. Um, now you can either, again, you can call yeah. into that number and ask for a service department; they can help you out with that. Yeah. Um, Google works wonders if that ever comes up. You know, if you neglect the air filters, let's say you don't change them, um, and a restriction um, code will come up. And then that would be the code. Okay. Like how many hours will we get on a full tank of uh, diesel? That is a question I'm not prepared to answer today, unfortunately. Um, I will, let me find that out for you guys. I'll let you know what that is. Yeah, I don't know the fuel consumption. So anybody have anything else? <laughs> I was thinking, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. something like that. Sounds all right. Anybody have anything else? Uh, don't be shy on that if you really want and and if you get if you get where to where you ask your um, Whoever's in charge of the crew or whatever and you're not satisfied with that push through that and say, you know I'm not I'm not, not even sure I mean here because it's expensive number one machine is and and it's Depending on what's going on. I mean, it's the fastest yeah. way to get hurt. That's I mean I started this with talking about how clearance matters walking around backhoes walking around loaders People that are ri riding around on tractors don't see you. You think they see you because you're looking at them. But the guy like you were handy, you were the second guy to run that, right? And if you notice, I walked away. I mean, like immediately. So, so I'm out. However, I'm going to kind of gauge you and watch you a little bit. But I would never approach you from the rear. Never. I would always be sure that I was away from the machine and coming right at you to gauge your attention. Because I can't count on the fact that you're seeing me, right? That's how accidents happen. So that's the only, I mean, it, they're noisy. They're noisy and they're moving. It's not like a towable chipper. So you definitely want to approach from the front, stay away from the machine, look at the operator, get his attention. You can see operating those joysticks. Everybody who's operated it, you can see what could happen if you get a little panicky. I yeah, mean, you you could see it. I mean, it's just, uh, and then not let go of something or or whatever, yeah. and the next thing you know, you run the damn thing up a tree, or or up a leg, or over your friend. Yeah, you know, so so how bad. So that's that's yes. Um, how often do you have to replace the knives usually? 
depending on um, what you send through it, um, there's not necessarily a like an hour reading. Um, we say you could ruin a set of knives in 30 seconds, you could ruin them in 30 hours. Um, so that's why every day we're going to recommend you open up that hood and, and take a look at it. Um, These knives are they the touch that uh, have the dual, dual knives? Correct, you yep. yep. You can flip them around um, and you'll be good to go there. Also, I did skip over the engine oil. It's going to be every 200 hours for your Change. engine oil. Yep. Okay. Okay. But before we get to you, one other thing. Take a look at those chips right there, brand new ones that we just chipped that one log. What they should always that's be that's optimum. If you if you're seeing big chunks, inconsistent, not looking good, you've either got dull blades or anvil spacing issues. So that's kind of a rule of thumb. I mean, you're not going to have that all the way through, but you're going to start to see it decrease, and then you start to go, you know what? I think it's time for us to take a look at that and get a spare set of knives. I mean, depending, you know, if you're sending them out to get sharpened. But I I would say. If you're gonna send them out to, if you're gonna send these blades out to get sharpened, I would personally send them. I'd box them up and send them down to Caroline, where they're not. That's not a thing that it, it just. You just don't know who else is doing it and to what standard they're doing it. You can take a taper out of those blades. Those things really easy if you're doing it wrong. Cause some guys can slap a grinder on there. Yeah. We see it happen all the time. Yeah, yeah. You take the temper right out of it. You, you ruin the knives. You just ruin them. Yeah. yeah, so, so, and, and it's not a bad idea to have a backup set of blades because if you send them out to get, you just don't know when they're coming back. So that's kind of the thing. I'm yeah. sorry, I missed that part. How, how, how is the process of changing the blades? Like if we're on a spike in the forest, if we had a, like a pair in the truck, could we switch them out? Yeah. Or? Yeah, yes. It's not hard. So um, that, that pin I was pointing out in the back there, um, would lock through the disc and then on this machine uh, it's a three-quarter wrench um, so one side has the bolt has an allen head and then a, a nut on it um, your allen wrench would lock in your three-quarter nut take that off take the knives off scrape the pocket off new knife boom um, when you when you put those bolts back on you just have to keep a torque wrench with that and torque those down to 100 yeah so there's that one in here that talks about that um but one other thing is is that you got to set that blade at the right distance and part of that is that gauge that silver gauge with the handle checking the checking the belt tension the other side of that is the clearance for that knife to anvil and the knife so there's a gap on it correct yes okay. yeah Anvil setting. So the anvil, when that knife comes around, you have a fixed part in here, and as the knife goes by, that's what starts to chip. Okay, when the knife comes swinging by on the on the loop, right? And so you have the anvil. Okay, so it's basically what it says it is, right? But if you have it too far, what's going to happen? You're taking it's just like a chainsaw. You're taking too big a bite. What happens when your chainsaw gets too big a bite? It, it bogs. Well, Okay, because it's too much of a bite, too much for the engine. So that's what's going to happen is you're going to stall it out. All right. Obviously, if it's too close, you're not going to get any kind of chipping. All right. So there's an ideal setting in there that you want it to be set at. All right. You know, there's we actually, knives. yeah. Go ahead. There's two knives in there. All right. There's one that's cutting right now. And there's one kind of like tucked back in or whatever you want to call it. All right. So if you want to change them out, sometimes if it gets real dull, you can take it out and flip it over and you got a new set of knives on the one side. Okay? Yeah. We may do, uh, right up the first year, we're going to, Hunter and I are going to go do some one-on-one -on -one, uh, chipper training without a bunch of people there just because we want to film some, uh, Cal Fire bought a bunch of machines and we want to just do it without a bunch and then we'll interact. We may end up trying to get uh, somebody else um, that maybe Scott, if he can swing by and then do a detailed thing on a sec separate clip about hey you want to change knives here's what that looks like and that would be a lot easier than to be here with a bunch of people yeah. not because it's yeah. good or bad but because we want to have something that's focused and close up and say you see this bolt here you pull this out this is why this is important this is what you do here this is what this tool does so if you give us another week or so right after the first we're gonna start to do stuff like that a little bit more it's kind of handy be really handy actually nice so what do you think that'll be good yep. well, we sure appreciate so, you guys yeah, yeah so you guys. anyway i i'm and the last thing because this thing is still rolling um it's unedited so whatever happens happens 
um, it's not fancy, but um, it is helpful. And if there's something on there and you watch this thing, not that I'm thinking any of you, you may fast forward to some spots, but if there's something on site and that we covered on here that you see and you go, I don't even know what that meant. Uh, stop and actually kind of figure out what we were talking about and then contact us because we'll be happy to like get that going. So and this is for all you chipper ladies out there. I'm over here at 4411 <laughs> California Highway 193. Give me a call. Thank you.